Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me here tonight. Um, week one of the BDSL season is just about in the books. So we're going to change up the podcast format a little bit. And going forward, it's pretty much going to be like a recap show. Um, the ongoings of the week that was, uh, previewing what's coming up in the league. Um, and I figured week one, let's go guns blazing. We'll bring in the heavy hitters uh, of the BDSL coverage. Um, joining me tonight, uh, Ben Sujimoto from uh, the Buffalo News soccer blog and Brian Radmaker, our former tre treasurer. And uh, I'll, I'll call him league extraordinaire. Um, so they're both here with me tonight. Uh, thanks for joining me, guys. Um, a lot to talk about uh, week one uh, with both of you guys. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know where to start first. Um, I think we'll talk to Ben, basically Ben, um, a, a I huge, I don't know where to start um, first, um, a huge result last night. Uh, I, I think we'll ben, talk to Ben, ben. what were you thinking? Ben, um, a, a I huge, I don't know where to start um, first, um, a huge result. Sorry, I'm getting a little feedback from my Twitch stream. Oh, there um, you go. Yeah, no, I'm sorted out now. Um, yeah, the big result last night, the, uh, the, the four, two Lackawanna win over BSC Raiders, um, it, to, to some degree, and it's hard to say off one game, but you know, you kind of see a changing of the guard a little bit in the BDSL, um, in the premier division, it's been Raiders, Raiders, Raiders for so long that, you know, it's been, you've always been thinking, you know, Raiders first, and then, you know, who are the other three teams that play against them in the playoffs to try to knock them off? Um, I think this year is going to be a little bit different. And then, you know, last night, nice game kind of showed that. Um, but it's important to remember that, you know, Raiders are up two to one at one point in the second half. They were playing well. They almost went up three one. Uh, and then Lackawanna just sort of broke them down and um, counterattacked and speed and, and good finishing in those final 15 minutes really just kind of turned the game on its head. Um, so it is just one, one result. And I think it's maybe a little premature to say, all right, Lackawanna, you know, now the Kings of the league and, and, and Raiders and whoever is trying to catch up to them. I think it's a little premature to say that, but I think you are starting to see the rest of the pack, you know, finally start to catch up to Raiders a little bit more. Brian, um, your, your thoughts on that result from the, uh, the first weekend here. Yeah. So a little bit of what Ben said, you don't want to overreact to just one result. Um, I mean, Raiders could go on a tear starting now and win the rest of the games, but I, I do think you might see a bit more of a crowded top of the division. And by that, maybe you've got a couple, two or three loss teams sitting between, you know, the first spot and maybe the fifth. Um, because Boss is still right there, even though they're a different looking team now. Um, they have brought in a lot of local talent that's currently playing at Niagara and Canisius, and they can make some noise. Um, there's a couple other teams that are, you know, right there too. So, um, yeah, you don't want to overreact, but this is now two, like, big, you know, primetime events that I guess have pitted Lackawanna and Raiders against one another. And Lackawanna has come up uh, as the winner you now the last two times. And what I'm including here is the Salem Cup final from 2020. So, you know, th now they can make the argument that it's not just a fluke. It didn't happen just once. Maybe there's a slight change coming, but we'll see. Um, I mean, I think uh, the question was asked, when was the last time Raiders lost week one? Um, and it dated back all the way to, was it 2008, 2007, was it? Um, so something like that. Uh, this year, them starting off on the back foot, um, it'll be very interesting. Um, I know in my preview column, I was a little bit um, leery on their chances. Like I, I wasn't entirely sure uh, maybe what was going to uh, happen for them because they, they lost, uh, you know, some big names, no Ryan Walter, no Figlers. Uh, that kind of stuff. Um, and the, of course, they got their recruits, but they weren't like the big names we're maybe used to seeing out of uh, Raiders. So um, my, my big fear for them is they've been able to count on additions from FC Buffalo um, as the season goes on. But some of the early names I've seen for FCB, uh, those, those guys are already on BDSL rosters. So I'm not entirely sure if that is going to uh, play in their favor as the season kind of progresses here. You guys have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I can jump in first. I think one of the biggest things for success in the BDSL is, is buying, right? Like 
if your team cares about showing up every week and doing well and, you know, making sure that you have at least a couple subs. I mean, obviously this is, you know, still um, not always everybody's top priority and in some ways, rightfully so. Um, but, you know, it's still, you have to be able to get that solid starting 11 and be able to have a little bit of depth because if you're showing up to games with 11 or 12, you run into trouble. And that's why, especially recently, those Raiders teams have been so successful is there was that body. Like uh, Anthony Johnson is really the guy who stepped up you know, got people to, all right, you're show up. This is how we're going to play. This is why we want to play this way. And this is what we want to achieve. And people listen to him. And that's why the team did very well. Um, it'll be interesting to see with a lot of new names, a lot more of the buff state influence. Are, are these guys going to become that same level of committed to Raiders that maybe the predecessors were? Um, I think for Raiders to really do well this year, that's going to need to happen pretty fast. Um, and I'm talking about guys like Nemo Simic and uh, Trevor Moreland and, and those kind of guys like going along with Colin O'Keefe and Rob Williamson, you know, that's, that's going to slowly become the fulcrum of the team. It's going to be less of the Chris Walters and less of the um, Grabowskis and so forth it, it, as those players kind of get older, you know, it's, the, it, there's always the, the, the changing of the guard and it'll be interesting to see how that, you know, plays with, with the Raiders. Brian, we talked uh, a lot about the Raiders here, but um, let's look at this from like a Lackawanna perspective. Um, last year was one of their best seasons as a club ever. Um, this year, um, they, they have their second uh, team in the UPSL. So, I, I mean, in my preview, I mentioned how this, this could be like an issue, like maybe split uh, mindsets here uh, on what to do. Early on, there's no conflicts. Later on in the season, it does. Um, this win kind of sets them up nicely going forward, at least in league play. Um, give us, give, give me your thoughts, like from a Lackawanna uh, perspective here. Yeah, so I'm a little hesitant in saying that they're going to outright win the league this year based on that. Um, I would think that if you're going to join the UPSL, there's going to be a commitment there. And then in hopes that perhaps some of the games that are scheduled in the BDSL are rescheduled so that they can you know, make the best of both worlds. It might not line up for them perfectly like that. So you could see a couple losses here and there that maybe at full strength um, they would otherwise win or be more competitive in. And it kind of touches exactly to the point that Ben made in those games where there could be some uh, conflicts, they could run a very short bench, 11 to 12 players or so. You can get by with that sometimes, even in as high as the championship division level. But typically in Premier, if you're not carrying 14 to 17 or somewhere in that range, um, it, it's it's just it's going to be rough because it's it's 90 minutes at one speed and it's just fast. So um, and even for a team as fit as Lackawanna, it, this it could be an issue. So, um, but only time will tell. I mean, this is a great win for them to get. I think it would have just made matters worse had they lost. And still be in the same you know position that I think they'll be in later in the season, but I don't. I honestly still think they're going to finish somewhere in the top three, one way or another. Um, I I don't want to dwell too much on this game because there's plenty of other stuff we could talk to. Ben, you saw uh, a second game uh, in the in the top flight. Um, probably the next mo most interesting game on the schedule for Premier Slate, at least in my opinion, um, Amherst uh, and Willie's. Amherst held out for the uh, the win there in that one. Um, had to feel good uh, for members of Amherst considering what went on between those two sides uh, and the rosters. Um, again, Ben, you were there at the game. Uh, you want to kind of give us uh, an idea on, on what you saw out there? Yeah, um, it was a, a good high-intensity um you could, but both teams were pretty fit, you know, that it, it wasn't apparent that, you know, in, in the other games that probably went on this weekend, there wasn't the, you know, lethargy and like huffing and puffing really early on. Like these teams played at a pretty good clip. A lot of them were coming off um, college seasons and it was a pretty entertaining game to watch. It had an interesting, I guess, nuance to it because neither team had either of their top two goalies there. Um, so they were both playing with field players in goal. So, you know, with that in mind, you're thinking, you know, it'll probably be a pretty high scoring game. Well, it really wasn't. Um, there were a decent amount of chances to go around, but I thought both Justin Hofschneider uh, for Willies and 
uh, Ricky Martinez for sharpshooters, you know, really did well for being field players in goal. Um, they, they did a decent job of controlling their box. Justin made a couple saves, you know, point blank that, you know, I was surprised that, you know, a, a non goalie would make. And then Ricky, uh, to his credit, did a good job controlling his box. I mean, he's dealing with a, you know, the six, three can jump considerably high Niagara striker, uh, Rodrigo Almeida, and he held his own. Um, so that was really kind of the cool storyline of the game is that you had two goalies who weren't goalies playing in a premier game and both, you know, did pretty well in a two, one result, you know, is, I mean, obviously Willie's won't be thrilled with that, but that the game was close and they were playing without either keeper was, was a pretty good achievement, I guess. I, I'm curious, was there like a sense of, I don't want to say animosity out there on the field, but uh, like, did you feel like maybe a different set of intensity considering, uh, the changes between the two squads like that, or, or was it just kind of like business as usual between the two? You know, I would love to make that a storyline, but it wasn't really. Oh, okay. um, a lot of these guys are friends off the field. Sure. Um, th th there were some, you know, kind of hard tackles, some jostling, but there wasn't anything that, you know, indicated that you know, there is really bad blood between sharpshooters and willies, and this is going to be a huge rivalry in the future. There's nothing of that that jumped out at me in the game. And you know, I felt like I had a pretty good, you know, grasp just sitting on the sideline, kind of hearing everything that went on. I didn't feel like there was that kind of, I mean, both teams were competing, but sure. there was nothing extra to indicate that it was a rivalry. Brian. I was, uh, kind of, I was going to jump in there. Yeah, I, I, was, I was actually secretly hoping that there would be. And, okay, yeah. you know, one would say that, maybe that game was on the schedule in week one on purpose, but I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, I mean, obviously a, a big result for, for Amherst um, here. Um, Willie's with a big changeover. I, I'm wondering if they looked at that loss as like uh, one that maybe got away from them um, and then looking at what's coming up for them. Uh, how does this set up Willie's maybe uh, through the month of May in, in your eyes here, Brian? I think Willie's are going to be just fine. Um, so I personally think that Ben covered two games yesterday involving four playoff teams come, uh, you know, the end of July. Okay. I, I just have that feeling. I don't know what the order will be, but I, I feel more comfortable saying that those four would be there and maybe boss and hopefully our team might round out the field, but it's so deep that it's hard to make that prediction now, but it's just a gut feeling of mine. I think, Willie's um, have a great mix of quality players, um, added players from sharpshooters, of course, that are already strong players, um, a good core of their own. And then th just the added mix of a few Niagara players as well. I think all of that comes together really well. And they can afford to miss a few people from here and there and still be deep enough to win games without, you know, a, a key piece uh, defensively, uh, up top, whatever it may be. So, before we jump away from Premier, uh, the other results, uh, Brian, your team, Queenston, had a, had a nice 5-0 uh, result over Beast. Um, and then the other one was uh, Celtic 2 over uh, Inter, or excuse me, uh, Celtic 4 uh, over Inter 2. Um, and then the last game on the slate for Premier, uh, oh, we had bus over OP Alliance 2, but uh, I, I guess most people would have said they expected that result. But the last game here, uh, before we move away from Premier, Polonia 6, Clarence 1, um, maybe maybe caught the attention of some people. Um, we had Jordan Mullen on the podcast uh, earlier in the week, uh, last week, and um, you know he gave us the, in, the impression that his team has every um, expectation to co compete in Premier. Um, seeing that result on the board early uh, versus Clarence, a, a playoff team last year, what are your, what are your guys' thoughts on uh, maybe the prospects Polon for Polonia moving forward? I can jump in on this one if you want first. Um, familiar with a lot of the Polonia players, and I think if there's one game in the Premier that matched a young and fit team against a team that hadn't played in a really long time team, that was very much the Polonia and Clarence game. And I think Clarence gets better from here. Um, I don't know how much better. I, I think they may be in a relegation fight this year. And if they want, they can put that in a little <laughs> game if they want to add fuel to the fire. Um, but it's tough, you know, that's a team that is getting a little bit older um, and, and hasn't made those younger ads that you've seen sharpshooters and bus and willies and so forth all make. And I think that's starting to cost them a little bit. Um, there are still good players there, though, and we'll see how much Gary Bouton is around this summer because 
I think when Gary is, you know, there and, and fit and cares, he can really change the game um, pretty considerably. And th there's still the components there for that team to be okay, but that's a rough first result. And if they don't dig out of the hole quickly, um, for Clarence, that's a problem. Real quick with Polonia, um, a good team, um, pretty good balance, uh, a lot of kids. Uh, they pull pretty well from some of the, the Allegheny County, the Houghton College, my alma mater is uh, pretty well represented there. Uh, but I mean, four goals from Colton Swanson in the first game. He's a guy who's another Southern tier young kid who kind of, you know, doesn't get a ton of attention up here in Buffalo, but um, certainly made some noise in that first game. And he has speed to get behind and can finish. So that goes a long way in the BDSL. So we'll see, uh, and Matt Brown, who's very familiar to us as a former Roo, um, obviously a, a key piece on the back line. Yeah, I was more surprised on Clarence's behalf. Um, you know, after looking at Polonia's uh, roster, I was like, okay, you know, this, this team probably will compete. I don't know exactly where their placement will be, but um, first of all, with Clarence losing Alex Reed, I thought that was a big gap or hole or void to fill right off the bat. Um, I'm not sure if Sam Sutherland was present yesterday, but you take those two guys away and now all of a sudden they might have a hard time scoring goals. They could hold the ball for all they want, but I'm not sure if they can put it in the back of the net. Um, so I was a little surprised though that they, they gave up six. Yeah. That was the most surprising part to me. Um, you know, it wouldn't have surprised me if I read Polonia three, Clarence two, they go, okay, good game, but six, one, I mean, that's, that was a stunner, definitely the stunner of the, the day for me, maybe across all divisions. Um, I think we could put a bow on that week for premier. Um, I, I want to move and again, briefly touch on championship, uh, here because there was only a few games played in that division. Unfortunately, uh, before we get to that quick score update for you, uh, we have uh, Lycan FC and Lycan United playing. Lycan United just went up one nothing. Uh, Carrera with a I butchered that last name um, that with, a, with a goal there uh, for Lycan United. So they're up one nothing. Um, I think that game's at Deuville, if I'm not mistaken. He's at Salins. Or is it Salins? Yeah. Okay. Um, so quick update there. Um, like I said, not too many games unfortunately played in Championship this weekend. Um, two results uh, that we do have on the board right now. Um, maybe both surprises uh, in good and bad ways. Um, Westside FC with the big 4 nothing result over Rangers. Um, I, two teams that maybe people would have said were the relegation candidates in championship, but Westside certainly exposing Rangers uh, with the 4 nothing victory. Um, and then Niagara FC with the 4-1 to win over Borussia Bees. Um, a team that had a lot of uh, talk about them being a, uh, a big threat in championship um, right off the gun um, for that team. Um, you guys have thoughts on either one of those results, uh, either or there? I do. Um, my first uh, reaction is I'm not surprised that Niagara FC won that game. Okay. Um, and I, I think a, a couple people heard me say that beforehand, that that was almost a slam dunk in my opinion. I don't think the bees are as good as they are making themselves out to be. There's still quality, but I, I think they're going to find themselves more in the middle of the pack there, not a promotion threat by any means. Um, and then when you go over to the Rangers West side game, that I think spells doom for Rangers. Um, I'm surprised by the four nothing result, maybe not the, the win per se for West side, but okay. uh, Rangers had for a long time been a middle of the table team in championship. And over the past few years, they've kind of dipped into that bottom level. I think technically they were relegated in 2019, yep. but just due to the shuffle um, they were spared. But I think maybe this is their last year in that division. It just seems that's another aging team. I mean, if you want to compare them to Clarence, a little bit different though. Rangers haven't really been a playoff threat, whereas Clarence has been in and out of the playoffs. But they're aging, uh, while the rest of the league is getting a little bit younger, a little bit more fit. Um, it looks like they still have the same core and commitment. It's just you know, you can't run away from time. So maybe D one is where they're they're at next. Ben, anything to add on those two uh, results there? Yeah, a little bit. I I, I think West Side's experience 
uh, assuming that they showed up, you know, pretty fit, I think plays a role. And, and Rangers, I guess, has experience too, but there just hasn't been too much excitement um, with Rangers recently. I mean, I think losing Ryan Chamber hurts because he's always kind of the threat to score. Um, and without him, you know, can you look at that roster and say, oh, you know, here's the star, here's the guy who's going to score. Um, I don't know. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, West side, on the other hand, um, Samu Gall always tends to, to get goals when he plays. And, and that's nice to have. Um, and, and there's that West side team is a physical team. Uh, Jackson Fresno scores goals, regardless of where he plays and how old he is. He's, you know, still in good condition and still in his, when, when he's really into it, he's a finisher. Um, so just those, those two pieces to begin with, I think makes a big difference and kind of moves that score line to making a little more sense to me. Um, going to, well, before we go to first division, um, we had the news come out about, uh, Easter RFC and their possible fold. Um, I, I don't know if that changes your opinions on the landscape of the division at all. I think most people had, uh, EAFC as like a mid tier team. Um, any thoughts there on the move there? There is there is some, I guess, uh, news that there's a potential uh, way to save it. Um, I'm not sure if that's going to uh, come through or not, but at least they're trying. Um, but any thoughts on that before we move on here uh, to D1? Yeah, um, so hopefully it is saved, but I think uh, the time is ticking. You don't want to get to the point where there's a few forfeits or uh, reschedules, and you don't want them piling up too much. Um, so if it can happen now, that would be great. Uh, you can probably reschedule that uh, Chupacabra's game to whomever takes the place. And I think it's important to have that extra team there just to have the true uh, ladder work the way it's supposed to. Um, but I will say that I think East Aurora probably would have been in the mix to be relegated anyway. Um, but I think just for the sake of the rest of the teams in the division, it'd be nice for them to all get a full 11 game slate. I know I would like that as a as a team participating in that uh, division for sure. Um, I'm pretty, uh, let me jump in real yeah, fast on the East Aurora topic. Uh, I, I have kind of mixed feelings about it because I, I saw Twitter was beating up on them pretty well. And, and I, I sort of thought, you know, well, rightly so. You know, you commit to putting a team together and you can't field a team and you, you know, kind of deal with whatever the repercussions are with that. But at the same time, we've seen a lot of East Aurora's players leave and join different teams. So I don't know a lot of the individual situations and, and how that happened, but it seems like as more younger teams um, either moved up divisions or new teams, it seemed like a lot of East Aurora's players for some reason kind of veered in those directions instead of staying with East Aurora. So uh, I, I, I can't pretend to know exactly what's going on in the East Aurora camp. Um, and I'm obviously disappointed that, you know, what happened happened and I hope they can, you know, salvage a season out of it but i don't know from a commissioner's perspective like i mean that is that a situation where you're like you know this is a good warning or a good precedent for other teams that might be interested in the league to be like eh, you know you should really make sure you got this figured out when you're starting a season and you don't fall behind the eight ball and trying to organize things i, I mean it's hard uh when i got the news it, i had kind of mixed feelings about it similar to what you said um I, I mean first as as the league president it's never nice to lose a team and it's especially frustrating the day before the season's supposed to start right um, mm -hmm. you, you know, we spend a lot of time making plans and getting things ready. And then to have that kind of pulled out, um, it does suck. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I am a manager of a team myself. Uh, I, I know the struggles, uh, as most guys do, uh, on manager, uh, you know, being a manager in the league, it's hard, um, you know, getting players to commit, um, especially when you're not like an as known product, uh, maybe in the league as, as other clubs. Um, I'd like to think, like, thankfully, like, Ru Ruse have a good reputation in the league, um, and we've been able to use that to our benefit when recruiting people. Yeah, I know. I see you shaking your head, Brian. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I could very well be wrong on that, right? I've seen my fair share of guys uh, move off of my roster and onto other teams, that's for sure. Uh, you know, you can look at Premier and Championship, and there's plenty of Ruse players, um, ex-Ruse players spread out amongst that. But, um, I mean, I certainly understand uh you know, the struggle of that. And then at the same time, you know, we all take it serious and we love it. Um, but there is like that aspect of like, is this going to be fun for me all year? Like if I'm a manager and I have 11 to 10 guys coming each week 
and I, do I want to play that string out and, and be like slaughtered? And at least, I guess I would say they pulled the band, you know, they like ripped the band aid right off. Um, how I phrased it to someone else, it, they're not like limping through the year, uh, you know, forfeiting one week, playing the next week with 13, and then, you know, forfeiting two more games or whatever the case may be. So, um, yeah, I, I kind of understand uh, at, at some point. I know other people, like you said, were kind of trashing them a little bit. Um, I'm not so eager to do it. I, I do uh, hope that it can be salvaged. If it can't, you know, so be it. Um, uh, I explained to them what would happen if they if they can't salvage it and, and they understand. Um, but, yeah, it's never nice to lose a team. It's never nice to lose it that late notice like that. But I'm not, I'm not going to, like, uh, you know, throw stones here, I guess. I think the main point that I'm taking away from this, uh, if I ever put a team together in the future would be, you know, come February, if, if I only have 14 committed guys, I think I wait another year to make that leap to put a team together. Um, if you're going to roll into the season in May with 14, it's, you're asking for trouble. I think if you're looking at 18 or so in February, you go forward. If you're anything less than that, um, that's where you really got to think it through, you know, make sure that that's in line first, get money up front from people, whatever it is, um, to make sure that there's enough people committed that you don't run into this issue. Yeah. It's I, I, like I said, we've all, all three of us have, have been uh, managers. So we all kind of know the struggles and, and the pros and cons of it. Um, but yeah, definitely it's, it, you got to get that commitment and that sense that, you know, you can see it out to really, uh, commit to the league. I think that's true. And and maybe that's something we have as a league have to do a little bit better. Um, I know we've toyed with the idea of maybe bumping back um, the um, final day for um, uh, application, right? Because, you know, so much can change between February and the start of the season that maybe it doesn't make a ton of sense this early to get teams to, you know, uh, commit to the league. But, you know, something we'll have to to work on as, as, uh, as a league together, I think. Um, but you know, we touched on that, uh, a good amount here. Um, let's get back to the action D one. Now it is, um, I'm looking at the scoreboard and I, I don't think there's too many surprises here. Um, the big game of the week, I think was probably between Sahara Gunners FC and Crimson Spall. Um, Gunners had similar to maybe bees had a lot of chatter about them coming into the year as potentially being a, a, a very strong team. Um, and Spall did a very nice job, in my opinion, um, on revamping their roster a little bit, um, added some good forward ranks. To my knowledge, Spall, Spall played pretty short th that game yesterday. Uh, Gunners had most of their players, to my to my understanding. And uh, in my opinion, Crimson played them really tough. Uh, a 5-3 to three, uh, loss should be nothing to hang your head about uh, when playing um Gunners, do you guys kind of share that uh, opinion here, looking at the game and the result? Yeah, I can jump with this one. I, I think these are, if not the two top teams in Division One, I, I think they're, you know, both playoff teams for sure. I think it's kind of hard luck for Spall in terms of how it's set up in their schedule. I think if this game is played in June or July, I think the game is, and I'm not saying the game wasn't close, because I think 5-3 still is relatively close, but I think yeah. Crimson Spall knew coming in that, you know, we're shorthanded. We're playing against a team that's fast and, you know, plays together and trains and plays year round. And that, you know, this might not, is not set up as a game that we're going to do well in. And I think you're right in saying that they acquitted themselves pretty well. A 5-3 result, you know, you never want to concede five goals, but, you know, under those circumstances, I think that result's not too bad for Crimson. But I think they would have preferred to maybe ease yeah. their way into the season a little bit rather than facing it was just a tough week one draw for Crimson and I, and I sort of feel a little bad for them, but you know, not super bad. <laughs> Brian, anything to add there on that one? Maybe, maybe the, does this put you down on gunners a little bit? I mean, you know, that, like I said, like we said, Crimson was a, a, a heavily favored team coming into the season, but to only post a five, three win over, over a week inside, what, what, do, what do you think that spells for gunners maybe moving forward? Well, I'm, I'm pretty much in agreement with Ben uh, okay. with almost everything he said. Um, it doesn't really move the meter for me much for either team. Um, because it's week one, in some ways you can toss it out. Um, but I think both of these teams uh, probably belong in the top one to three spots in the division come season's end. Um, I think it was the right move bringing the Gunners up to this division. 
Um, they, I think, are uh, to me maybe the the that's where I place my money, I guess, on who will be in championship next year. Okay. Um, so giving up three goals, I don't know. It could just be their style of play. You might see a lot of games involving the Gunners this year where they win eight to four, seven to two, things like that. So um, no, I, I but valiant effort by Crimson if they're only bringing twelve guys. And I know they didn't have the right guys either. There were some big names missing there. So clearly a very solid squad who will be towards the top of the table come season's end. So going from what I would have called like the, the game of the week there, um, I, the surprise of the week for me was maybe the Polonia legacy win. Uh, big win over Honey Badgers, 8-2. to two. Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think uh, I'm surprised necessarily at the win, but at the the weight of it. I, I mean, that's a big score line, a lot of goals being piled in by a Polonia team that isn't necessarily known for like a, a big um, you know scoring threat, at least in years past. And especially when you split a squad like they did, um, you know, who, who, who really knows who's going to get uh, what kind of players. But it seems like, um, you know, even though, in my opinion, Badgers are one of the, the teams down the ladder in D1, um, it seems like they at least got enough to maybe even contend here in first division. I think it's kind of early to read in uh, to both of these teams. I, I know that the Polonia legacy team it was actually constructed pretty well in how those teams split. Um, I think they're definitely, you know, placed correctly relative to the other Polonia side. I think the Polonia, Polonia elite team is, is obviously, you know, considerably better and they've been placed rightfully so. Um, but I, I still don't think that the D1 team is by any means weak. Um, I think there's a good mix there of younger players. They also have a couple Houghton players. So you can tell there's that Jordan Mullen connection that's sort of, you know, filters down and has an effect. And it's a good mix of young players and old players. And I think that can often lead to a team that is a little bit more organized, but also is a little bit more athletic. Um, and, and, you know, maybe that was the case yesterday. I, I wasn't there. I didn't see the game. Um, I know Honey Badgers, you know, have had their challenges both, I think, in attendance and in results, you know, in recent years. And, you know, are they maybe in threat of relegation? I mean, after week one, you can't really say definitively anyway, sure. um, but I think it's not looking, you know, favorable if there's another couple of results like this. I mean, I, I was also surprised to see the amount of goals in that game. Uh, uh, go ahead, Brian. I was going to say division one looks uh, strong enough this year where I think um, this is concern for honey badgers. Um, I know to Ben's point, it is early, but there's only so many games in the schedule where I think they can pick up points and, before coming into yesterday, I would have assumed that maybe this was one of their chances. And I only thought that because when you typically split a club in half and you place one up in Premier that's good enough to go in Premier, I would think that you're leaving the scraps essentially for the lower division. But that doesn't seem to be the case here, which is good. Um, it looks like they had enough quality to go around and split it right and um, maybe turn a little heads because it's hard to score eight goals uh, no matter who you're playing. So clearly they're, they're going to be skillful and somebody to not take lightly in the division. Um, other results from D1 uh, this past weekend, we had Celtic Brigade 3-0 uh, over uh, Celtic 1888. Um, New York Elite and Delco Academy, a rematch from last year's championship in uh, D2. Uh, they tied at one. Uh, ben, your Celtic uh, squad, Buffalo Celtic, took a 2-0 uh, win over Tonawana United. And um, I, I think this result, when I uh, saw it came in, either or, uh, further cemented this team is maybe my favorite now going forward in first division. Uh, NMBFC with a 5-1 victory over USA or USABFC. Um, I mean, I, I really like this uh, NMBFC team. Um, I think they made a lot of good ads. Um, the, the players that they got from ECC, uh, Tim Ellis uh, in particular, all very strong players. Um, I think this result folds really well for them uh, moving forward in the division. Um, and if they can keep playing like that, I, I see no reason why they shouldn't be considered uh, the favorite uh, out of the remaining D1 field. Yeah, if I'm a premier team looking to make a move, you know, later in the season, I mean, you know, I might have Tim Ellis's cell phone number on hand. <laughs> I'm not in that situation because I'm not a Premier League manager, but I'm just saying that, 
four goals in week one, and he did very well in Salem's Cup too this yeah, in 2020. So, I mean, I think this is a, a player in a team whose stock is pretty high. And I think youth is very much on their side. You know, they, I, see, I think there's some continuity, and I think there's youth. And in D1, it takes you a long way. And this is the same team that lost Andy Loomis to the Sharpshooters. So imagine if they still had them or him, uh, they'd be even better. But it looks like they might be the main beneficiary of the uh, pause that FTR is taking this season before potentially returning in 2022. I think they picked off a few of their guys. So it'd be interesting to see if NMB does get promoted at the end of the season what that does to FDR and if anybody defects back to them or if they maybe merge together and continue on a, a better, stronger NMB team championship division. Yeah, I, I was thinking that too, Brian. I, I noticed that, uh, you know, that heavy collection of guys from FTR uh, that would have been a team in the league last year uh, on this roster. And it, it appears like they have the right mixture, um, certainly kind of going forward here. Um, we'll take a look at uh, the second division now. Um, in Pepper, uh, you had the closer games uh, out of the bunch. Um, I think the game maybe of the week there was maybe Mez K FC versus North Buffalo uh, FC. Uh, Mez K, again, a case of guys uh, not having a ton of guys, but still pulling out a big one nothing result. Um, I know this North Buffalo FC team is, is maybe uh, not as known as some of the other clubs, uh, especially considering, uh, you know, when they were in third division, not having a ton of success, but this is a, a, a totally di different set of, um, you know, leaders on this, uh, on this team. Um, and I, I look at that roster and I, I like a lot of what they have there. Um, so that's a team I, I like, um, but Mezke securing that one, nothing win uh, week one, I, th I think is a, a good indication of, of how, you know, very many people like them coming into the season and, and here they are proving exactly why that is. I think Mesk is, is a really interesting situation. And I think maybe Brian can elaborate more on North Buffalo. But uh, but Mesk, it's it's funny because it's a team of a lot of coaches and then a lot of kids. Yeah. So you wonder about availability throughout the summer in terms of you know how many players are they going to be able to turn up. But at the same time, they built a roster that's really talented. There's a lot of you know, very proven names. It's it's funny to see guys like, you know, I guess Regan Steele and Sean Hallis and um, you know, people along those lines. And then also you're looking at, you know, a really good crop of younger players, Ryan Adams, Tom Enstis, you know, there's uh, Ewan Reynolds. It's funny that there's such a divide of like coaches in their upper thirties, you know, mid thirties, and then kids who are like 17 and 18 on this team. It's a pretty, it's a funny dynamic. Um, but, you know, it, it's one of those cool things in the BDSL that you can have a situation like that because the team probably looks a little funny when they're competing. So you got some <laughs> older guys and some like guys who are probably their kids, right? So yep. it's it, it's amusing to me, but I think that is a good team at the same time. Yeah, I think so too. I think um, Meske could win that division. Although that that North division is really good. And, yeah, I mean, if you really look at it. Um, there's a bunch of solid teams there. Somebody's going to be left out that I guess um, maybe would have made it rather easily in the Southern Division, Simkin, I think it's called. Um, but yeah, North Buffalo, I think, was one of those teams that I had personally placed in the top half of the North Division. And I think they almost proved their worth in a loss uh, because Meske, I kind of got the sense that, you know, every week they run away with some of these games, but that one seemed to be pretty close the whole way through. Um, yeah, I, I don't know too much about the individual people in terms of, you know, have I played against them enough to understand how they really uh, work, but I've heard the names, I've seen the names enough to understand that it's a good collection of guys from teams like DSC Buffalo in the past that were solid enough. Um, so, or maybe even Queen City Pride, I think there's a couple guys mixed yeah. in there too. Um, I hated that name, by the way. Like, <laughs> you have to go Q there and Queen. I just that, that was a stay away for me. So I'm glad they're on North Buffalo Bucks, you know. <laughs> I wonder why you don't like uh, another team encroaching on your uh, Queen uh, Monopoly over there. Um, the one result that came in tonight, Kilimanjaro Bandits with a big come from behind uh, victory over uh, Westside Blitz. I believe the final there was 5-3, to three, if I'm not mistaken. Um a team, Kilimanjaro, uh, they're playing in the Teal Cup, one of the teams that decided to play up uh, along with Mez KFC. 
Um, I, I think, uh, again, a, a team that not many in the league are going to know a lot of the names on. Um, but for me, uh, it's exciting to see like these inner city um, teams that come into the league um, and perform at a high level. Um, I mentioned in my previews that for them, it seems like the biggest struggle is not the talent on the field, but uh, getting that cohesion uh, as a team and maybe the leadership off of it. Um, and if one of these uh, managers is able to kind of put that together, I think, you know, you'll see a very strong um, team from the inner city kind of, kind of come out of that. Um, and, and I think bandits have uh, one of the best looks at that in a while. We had BB boys um, for a while um, and, and they, they did well enough until the end when it, when it fizzled out real quickly. Um, but I think bandits maybe have a good look at uh, succeeding where others have failed. Yeah, I like that. I like that Bandits, I believe, played a, a pretty aggressive uh, preseason slate in terms of playing teams that were in bigger divisions than they were. Um, and, and I think there is some BDSL history, you know, among a lot of the players who were there. You know, I mean, I've heard of Sapa Mashamango. I've heard of um, Kabura Elias is a guy that we've known for a while in the BDSL. Um, so, so I think there's a lot of talent there and it, I don't know what their continuity is in commitment and so forth, but um, the fact that they, you know, were willing to challenge themselves against better competition before the year, you know, put themselves into the teal cup and, and give themselves a chance there. Uh, I think that's, I think that's pretty cool and pretty ambitious of a, um, a new team, I guess. And I, I, I don't know, is there a Great Lakes Africa tie in there, Brian? You might know better. Yes, yes. And Great Lakes Africa did well one season, also did well the second season until they fizzled out for other unknown reasons. So I believe um, with that in mind, if they did that well in Division One, you kind of expected them to do well in this division here. And the names that you threw out there were part of the South Towns family practice team from 2019 or Lakeshore Select, how I like to still refer to them as. Um, and those were some of their like key ads that, that um, season. So I, I fully expect this team to be really good. And quite frankly, when I saw Westside um, was up by a couple of goals, I was kind of surprised, but there, there's some talent there too on the blitz. Um, so it just further, clouds what's going to happen in the, in the pepper division this year it's just so deep i mean i walked past devils and youngstown playing yesterday before my game and even that game looked pretty strong um and both teams moving well uh it, it didn't look like they were gassed uh, even though it was the tail end of their game so uh, who knows it's just going to be a really really good division you can't take any weeks off in Simpkin, uh, the second uh, part of second division, um, I, the results were a little bit mixed, I think, between teams we had kind of favored and, uh, you know, pulling upsets uh, or getting upset rather um, versus other teams. Um, I, I think the, re the result that maybe surprised people the most was maybe Great White Buffalo uh, falling to Hamburg FC, one nothing there. Um, I would also say, uh, you know, two new teams in Outlaws and Lakeshore FC. Um, I, I liked both of them, but I, I was a little surprised to see Lakeshore FC um, fall there. Um, I think they were down a man for most of the game. Um, the rest of the, the scoreboard here, FK Bosna 6 over uh, Cheektowaga White Eagles 1, Southern Tier 4, uh, JL Dutch 0, and then uh, Moby Ducks scoring the one uh, nothing result over Western New York United Reds. From Simpkin, any of these results kind of stand out to you guys? Uh, any team you thought maybe overperformed, underperformed this week? I liked um, the Southern Tier victory because uh, I think this is the division that's really up for grabs. I, I kind of thought maybe FK Bosna would um, kind of cruise and then maybe the next level down would be Great White Buffalo and Hamburg. I, so I wasn't totally surprised at Great White Buffalo lost, but I probably would have assumed the reverse score there, maybe one nothing to Great White Buffalo, but um, Southern Tier's smackdown on JL Dutch was surprising because I think Dutch is a pretty good team. So yeah. if if they're winning 4 nothing there, then maybe they're the team to beat. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's really two teams in this division that I think will end up. I mean, I think FK Bosna is pretty much the, the favorite without, you know, a lot of the competition. Um, I think Southern Tier FC 
You know, it's funny. There's a current thread to sort of a lot of the things we've mentioned tonight. And a lot of it is there's good players in the Southern tier who've, you know, really become involved in the BDSL and done pretty well in the BDSL. I know there's the connection between Olean, uh, but also Polonia draws a lot from the Southern tier and both of their teams. And now, you know, the Southern tier, tier FC themselves, you know, carving out a pretty good niche in, in, in D2. I think that's, that's something that I've noticed in the past couple of years, but it seems to be growing to an even, you know, more of a fever pitch now that, you know, there's talent in the Southern tier and it's also an advantage to play in the Southern tier, as we know. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you know, you're drawing the, the, um, the lines from Olean to, to both Southern tier and Polonia. And their inclusion of the league has definitely brought about uh, more attention on us um, from those areas. And and you're right, the the talent pool was much better than even I expected. Uh, when Olean first joined, I was like, ah, you know, maybe there'll be a solid you know D2 team. The drive might push them up into D1. But now here they are, you know, sitting in championship two years later. Um, and now, uh, you know, two other teams sprouting out. Not not that Polonia sprouted out, but the, like you pointed out, Ben, the the influence is very heavy there now. Uh, from the sou southern areas, um, so yeah, I, I find that very interesting, and it it makes me happy that we did, you know, take that leap, um, and and kind of grow that section uh, of the league out for sure. Yeah, it looks like just the footprint has grown, and that's just going to attract more talent. So uh, the talent will spread further down divisions just naturally, and I think you're seeing it here. Um, we'll go uh, on to the third division here. Um, I, my favorite result from uh, these games, uh, there was one tonight, uh, Infinity FC with the late one nothing victory over Bangarang. Uh, I saw a report online that it was in uh, into stoppage time where they got the uh, eventual game winner. So um, tough loss for uh, BDSL um, secretary Colin there. Um, but my favorite result from this past weekend was uh, Bu South Buffalo FC uh, six over Celtic Classic three. Um, I I was rather surprised by that. I looked at South Buffalo's roster. Um, I know some of the players on this um, from my history based in the South Towns um, here. Um, I know they have a fantastic goalie in Ryan Gall. Um, they have uh, a mix uh, similar to what we were talking about with uh, Mezke of younger and, uh, and older talent. Um, but to see them, you know, hang one on Celtic Classic, who, um, you know, not the best team in, in Division Three, but definitely have plenty of experience in the league. Um, to see them get, you know, kind of walloped here, 6-3 was an eye-opener for me. Um, the other games, uh, I mean, at Meerkats, I kind of expected to win. Uh, Monarchs versus Lazio, uh, I kind of expected Monarchs to win. Um, but that one kind of stood out to me. A anything you guys draw from seeing the results uh, here in, in, in D3? And I know it's, it's just week one, so a lot of this is, you know, taking things at face value. Um, but, the, you know, you can draw some conclusions, I think, uh, from some of these early results. I have a couple of thoughts, um, and they all also relate to South Buffalo FC. Okay. Um, I think they lead the league in players, most players with the same last name. I, I want to say yes, too. Uh, <laughs> there how are many hugs do they have? Four? Yeah, okay. Well, how, many, how many hollers do we have on Tonawanda? Also four, and that's a good point. Yeah. What about... Uh... What about Los Chupacabras? How many Strangios do they have? I think they're at two. At two? I think they added one more, so maybe they're at three now. Yeah, three Strangios. Yeah, yes. okay. So we're, there's a couple teams uh, battling for that uh, family supremacy, I guess. Four, four hooks and two fins on that team. <laughs> you're a, you're a oh, classic, classic literature person. <laughs> it sounds like South Buffalo. Yeah. <sighs> But yeah, I mean, uh, them scoring that result, um, I think is a is a big thing for them. Uh, I I saw them maybe coming into the year as is not like the bottom of D three, but not not the top of D three either. Um, and and I think that that kind of game uh, can put some confidence in them and and maybe kind of uh, inspire that, them to kind of aim higher, you know, uh, moving up the table. So um, I, I I don't know. Uh, I'm probably being a little bit biased because I want them to do well because uh, they represent my hometown area here. Um, but that's just how I feel on them. So, Well, one quick question related to, to, to D3. Sure. Are we confident that, that Meerkats is, is probably the cream of the crop there, or do we feel differently about that? Man, I, I mean, Brian is going to tell you yes, I think. And I, 
it seems like when I back them, they play poorly. And um, it's one of those teams, um, maybe similar to Celtic United in a way, uh, looking at like a premier team where um, on paper, they appear like they should perform really good. But for some reason, there's just something missing, um, whether that's chemistry, whether that's consistent attendance, um, you know, whether that's reliability in, in net or uh, up top and goal scoring, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, and, and as an outsider looking in, um, it's really hard to put a finger on that because you look at the team, you look at the results and um, they're confusing because you're not quite sure why why those things are happening, especially when you have, uh, you know, players for Meerkats who have played premier soccer before. Um, so, so they know the league. It's not like they're rookies. It's not like um, they're a young team. This is a, a, a middle, uh, you know, average age team with, with um, BDSL experience and, and not like most teams, um, but, but their players know and can play at high levels. So I, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder, is this a, is this us like undervaluing D3 when we see players like this drop down do, and we automatically expect the team and the results to, to go up with that. Um, maybe it's just a, a, you know, a bias from the teams at the tops to expect that. Um, or maybe it's the guys not caring as much. I, I really don't know. But I again, I would say Brian is going to tell you he favors them, but they did get the opening season win. And I, I did pick them, I think, in my preview to finish high up the table. But if they don't uh, move up, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised either because, uh, you know, we've seen this from them a couple times over the past few years. Well, first of all, I love the comparison between Meerkats and Celtic United because I never thought of that before, but you might have hit it right on the head there. Um, you know, it seems like every time I do back the Meerkats, which has been basically an annual thing nowadays, um, the next thing, you know, they lose eight to two and there's no explanation behind it. And the only thing I can think of is they they have a couple of very solid players who drop down to that division to potentially not show up quite as often. And when they don't show up, then suddenly the trickle down effect happens and the team is a shell of what it could be. That's the only thought I have there. I think the reason why when you take a few premier or championship names and place them um, on a D3 roster, you think success right off the bat, but if they're not there, it's it's not going to move the meter. Right. These, these teams have played together long enough in the lower division that they're still solid enough as, as a unit. Um, so I, I think to your point, you got to be a little careful with judging a team based off of paper. Um, there's definitely more to it. Now, having said that, I really like the Greg Hoffman ad. And if he's there often, and being that he's very close friends with um, Andy Wackenheim, who I would assume will be there most times, if not all games, then I can see them both being there always. And at that point, I think they're going to, um, those are two names that I think will help them, you know, stay atop the division. But I'm not going to pick them to win the division just because if I do, it's not going to happen. And I want to see them win. I want to say one thing, uh, you, you know, you said like having their, their attendance, you know, um, uh, when the players aren't there, it hurts the team. Uh, sometimes I wonder too, like if that, if when they don't show up, it, it, it even is more of a deterrent um, to the rest of the team, because you get that sense of like, uh, like dread. Like I, I've been in positions before where I've had like really high end players on my team. And when they don't come to games, you know, the team itself is like, well, why isn't he here? You know, we need him and whatever. And you can kind of see that mentality, you know, wave over the team, you know? Um, and that that's that can be quickly destructive uh, mentally uh, when you have a guy who's, who's maybe head and shoulders above the rest of your roster talent-wise, and he, he is flaky and he's not showing up. Um, it... it it can hurt the rest of the squad and not just on the games he's there, but on the games or uh, he's not there, but the times he is there too, because it can become kind of frustrating to the rest of the roster, you know, cause you get a, a good win and you see how good you can play with him. 
but but then all of a sudden he's not there and and you're you know you're getting smacked or whatever the case may be so um it, there is a danger in that and sometimes adding a, a top end talented player like that um with the knowledge that they might not be super committed because you know if you become to reliant on them and they and they let you down like that that's a that can be really demoralizing to not to the entire team well yeah and it's the positional shift too um yeah. usually if you're going to grab an elite player so they're probably going to play down the spine somewhere at center back center mid if they're no longer there then somebody else is shifting into that position that maybe otherwise wouldn't play there wouldn't want to play there and it kind of is a you know ripple effect from there so suddenly everybody's out of position and it, it could be a detriment to a team in that division versus, say, a little bit higher up the chain. Right. Anything still, to end there, Ben? Sorry. I'm still bullish on Meerkats. And okay. the reason why I'm saying that is um, there's maybe five or six guys from Beast City who were playing with Beast last year. And then as Beast got that promotion um, to Premier, um, I guess from 2019 to be accurate, um, we got that promotion to premiere. A lot of those guys dropped down and Meerkats happened to be that destination. So you have guys who are one year removed from, you know, being the the veterans on a, on a team that was pretty quickly rising up the table. I'm talking, so someone like Brock Preisel, who, you know, is, is somebody who I'm surprised is, is playing in third division because he's capable of playing much higher. But I mean, you, you look down the roster, Nick Ruiz, Andrew Kennard, um, Anthony Galvano, there's just a lot of um, players with, you know, pretty decent pedigrees who were not that long ago were playing at higher levels. So, I mean, I, I think it's, it, it is maybe a question of like, did these guys go down in, in order to play a little bit less and not have to be like, quote unquote, relied upon to show up every week and contribute. And I think Brian makes a good point with that, but I would be surprised just given, you know, the, the how beast was built and how they moved up and the commitment that was required in doing so seeing four or five of those guys be a part of the meerkats team is why i'm you know thinking that there's probably that level of organization and level of investment that um you know running a team with pride regardless of what division you're in it matters right and yeah. uh, and i think there is that you know innate caring you know where you at least want to show up and represent yourself well that you know maybe in meerkat's history wasn't always there so i think those are those are really good points ben um you know when you when you do make the commitment uh to a roster like that as a manager um you kind of have to have that expectation so i think those are good points there um well i think we ran the gambit here on the full slate uh of team or of games this past week um, I was hoping to get another update in here on the uh, the Lycan Derby going on, but I uh, don't see anything online for it, unfortunately. Um, so in, as far as I know, it remains one nothing in favor of Lycan United. Um, before we go here, I'm just looking real quick at the, the Premier League slate for, for next week. Um, for me, the game that jumps out, and Brian, you could probably touch on it, Queenston FC versus BSC Raiders. Um, I think it'll be very interesting to see the response from Raiders, um, you know, falling in that 0-1 hole. Um, you guys had a very good result, you know, against B City, a team that um, uh, I'm not sure on their chances in in Premier uh, this year. Um, but I can I can actually talk a little bit about Beast. Sure. Just really quickly, um, you know, they're actually a pretty talented team. What we saw them yesterday was a a light bench. Um, they had 12 guys there in total, um, but all their players were quality. I think the issue for them and they'll see it in the beginning of their season is maybe they won't have all their guys, but they certainly lacked cohesion. Um, I think that'll take a few weeks to get going. The unfortunate part of that is I believe they have Lackawanna this week and then they get Raiders after that. So okay. I'm thinking they're going to be in an 0-3 hole uh, realistically. Um, and just to touch on our game coming up with Raiders, we're always excited to play them. Um <laughs> We, we've played them tough in years past, but I don't really love the fact that we're playing them when they're coming off of a loss, to be honest there. So we'll see how it goes. Ben, I think for you, uh, this next coming week, you're playing one of the Celtics, right? I think it's Celtic Brigade, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, what, what are your thoughts there on, on playing a, a team from the family? So I, I'm kind of a new Celtic player, so I don't really have a grasp on too much of what games like are between Celtic teams. I know that they 
there's a there's a certain level of like it matters a little bit more to, to the people in charge. Um, so I mean, I'll happily treat it as such. Um, I, I don't. This is you know my you know first time playing with Buffalo Celtic, first time playing against either Celtic Brigade. I think it is Celtic Brigade. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's a Crosby Field derby. I'm excited to be a part of it. Um, and for me, uh, I'm playing our first game of the season this year after, uh, unfortunately, we had to cancel uh, the opener here against Olean. Um, I, I don't even know who I'm playing, honestly, because uh, You're playing Lycan. I've been doing too much other things aside from paying attention to my own team. Is it FC or is it United? Lycan FC. Lycan FC. Okay, so a rematch of our uh, quarterfinal game. I'd be looking forward to that. It appears m like maybe they're going to fall here to Lycan United, so they're, they're probably not going to be too happy about that. Um, and I know they made some nice additions in the offseason uh, to spruce up the lineup, so... Um, you know, my roster has changed over a lot. I'm really looking forward to seeing us on the field for the first time uh, this year. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm just uh, this weekend I had to watch all the results and uh, everyone get excited about playing. I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, doing the same uh, next week uh, when we take on Lincoln. So um, any closing thoughts here, guys, we didn't touch on before we uh, wrap this up? I say it was a pretty good week one, you know, in the BDSL. I didn't see a ton of red cards, um, which was, you know, a good sign. And I don't know if some of, if some of that is just because people didn't have the legs and the wind to, to make those kind of rash tackles or what. <laughs> I thought from what I could tell, and I, I could be wrong, but I think discipline was a pretty good thing um, in the first week. I think, you know, I, I think there was a general excitement to be back on the field and back competing in the BDSL and back you know, whether with old teammates or with new teammates, I think there was just a, that the return of BDSL brought a certain return of normality to things. And I think that, you know, in whatever sphere of life we're talking about, I think that's important. And I think in the soccer world, the return of the amateur soccer league is, you know, something to be excited about. So uh, to me, both on a personal and like a local soccer level, I think it was a pretty important thing that, you know, things went off without a hitch and, and everybody was back on the field again. Yeah, I, I echo that sentiment, Ben, especially as, you know, the guy uh, being looked at, at when it's all said and done as did it work or not. Um, I, I was very grateful at uh, so many people who helped us make it happen, especially our, our very many field providers um, who were willing to work with us, um, you know, back in, in February when the outlook wasn't as quite as positive as it is now. So um, behind the scenes, there's a, certainly a lot more than just the stuff um, everyone sees uh, that made everything work. So, um, yeah, I mean, the lead up to the week was awesome. Um, and I was super happy to see everything go off without a hitch for sure. I have two more quick things to add, and they both relate to referees. Okay. I want to say, uh, best of luck to Steve Adamek, who's getting his second knee replacement. I think yeah. that's uh, the guy who's been around roughing for a long time. And uh, so it's a just, loss. That's a loss for for us for sure. Best wishes for him as he kind of handles that. But it's also great to see Tom George back refereeing. And I know he's you know he's come from a lot of really come through a lot of big challenges um, just health wise. And to see him refereeing and to see the kind of you know community caring that he's back and you know you know bellowing at players, explaining things friendly <laughs> in friendly fashion but stern fashion. Um, I think that's you know, it's great. Like this guy was, you know, given a not that great prognosis, you know, not that long ago. And he's back, you know, doing what he loves to do in the summer. So I just wanted to make sure that, you know, Steve Adamick and, and Tom George got, got mentions. I fully agree with that, especially I, I did not know Tom was coming back until uh, I started looking at some of the ref reports and I saw his name on there and I was like, oh, my God, he's he's uh, he's back. That's amazing. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm super excited to see him. And I know uh, I was talking to Steve um, about his surgery. Um, I He is a guy who I'm sure when he is uh, ready and able, um, he'll be out at the fields uh, to take in a couple games with a, a beverage or two. That is for sure. Um, and I certainly look forward to seeing him back once uh, that surgery does finish up. So, yeah, very well said. The, ref the refereeing this week, uh, by every team's account, was almost excellent. I think uh, I, I had never seen... Uh, when we sent out the team reports uh, for the games. I, I don't think I've ever had a week uh, quite like this one where we got so much positive feedback um, from the officials, you know, 
and, and uh, like you said, Ben, uh, um, cards were down, uh, less red cards. Uh, I think we'll end up with maybe the same yellow, if not a little bit less, depending on these games tonight. Um, but overall, uh, you know, definitely thanks to them for, for the job they do week in and week out, our officials. For and sure. and that's, that's quite the reflection on us, the players, too, because you think now that we're back playing, I think everybody – uh, treated this week one as if it was the first time it was sunny after, you know, two weeks of rain. We're excited, happy to play. And, you know, suddenly the rep reports are good. Maybe it's because we were all enjoying ourselves out there and not worrying about, you know, you know he looked at me the funny way. I got to go punch him. You know, it, yeah. like that kind of stuff uh, just d didn't seem to be out there this week. And it's amazing if, if you bring a positive attitude, it could actually go a long way. I agree. I very, very much so agree. Um, but hopefully that that kind of mentality, you know, takes hold uh, here and we continue that going forward. Um, but yeah, guys, uh, thanks so much for for hanging out with me here. I can't believe we went over an hour. Actually, I can believe we went over an hour. Um, I kind of knew that going in, but um, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to the rest of the season here. Um, should be a very fun one. If any if week one was any indication on what we're in store of. Uh, so happy to be back. Uh, in the league and, and, and both of you guys and your coverage of it is uh, well appreciated. So thanks for joining me here today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right, guys, that's going to wrap it up here uh, for the uh, podcast. Thanks to everyone uh, for tuning in. I think uh, we hit close to 50 viewers live uh, tonight, which is pretty impressive. Uh, most, most streams would kill for that kind of um, uh, initial coverage, especially uh, just starting out like this. So, um, a huge thank you to you guys for tuning in um, live like this. Uh, this will be posted at some point uh, tomorrow, hopefully, uh, depending on how my work allows it. Um, but again, thanks to everyone for tuning in. Thanks to the guests here for joining. Um, and we'll see you guys on the pitch and next week. Thanks, everyone.